Hello everyone, we will begin our quantitative research method class with some discussion on scientific method. My name is Yopina, let's get started. There are several ways or methods of acquiring knowledge. The first one is by using our intuition. So basically intuition is any our personal knowledge or insight that we have no idea or any reasonable explanation of how did we gain the knowledge. The second way of acquiring knowledge is using authority. So this is all the information and knowledge that we gain from someone else whom we consider very important in our life or whom we respect. For example, when we get information or knowledge from our lecturers or professors or teachers or someone else whom we respect, then we are using authority to gain that knowledge. The third method is rationalism. This is a knowledge that we gain by following a certain reasoning processes or thought processes. Many of the big philosophers were actually using this rationalism. They were thinking about something very deeply to explain a phenomenon. Next is empiricism. This is the knowledge or information or a conclusion that we gain by experiencing something. So basically when we're doing a research, normally we will use this method to acquire knowledge or making conclusion about our results because we are making hypotheses and we probably conduct experiment that's the ex experience part of the research and then we make conclusions based on that and then there's this, this induction and deduction method induction is basically when we make a general conclusion from something specific so from specific to general so for example when we see a kid a kindergarten kid uh, hitting uh, another another child in a classroom, then we make a conclusion that all kindergarten kids are aggressive, then we are using induction. Deduction is basically the opposite of induction. So this is when we make a specific conclusion from something very general. So for example, if we see a theory that all kindergarten kids are aggressive, then when we see a uh, one one kid one kid in in a classroom in a kindergarten classroom then we would expect that at one point this kid would hit one of his friends then we are making you know a specific conclusion about that particular kid in a particular classroom from something very general there are at least three characteristics of scientific research the first one is the element of control this is when we're holding constant or trying to eliminate the influence of extraneous variable. Extraneous variables are other variables beside the variables that we are trying to explain. So if we have independent variable and dependent variables, the extraneous variables are other variables. So they are not independent or they are not dependent variables, but they might affect or influence the relationship between our independent and dependent variables. So we will try to consider all of these extraneous variables and we try to control them. We can use uh, some statistical um, method, some statistical ways, some statistical strategies to control the extraneous variable. Or in experimental research, we will really try to eliminate as many as possible the potential extraneous variables to really make our research cleaner. The second characteristic of scientific research is operationalism. So we will have to be specific and precise in defining each of the variables that we are trying to explain. So each concept must be defined. So for example, if we want to study about intelligence, then we will have to define intelligence in a very specific and precise way. We have to operationalize what does it mean by intelligence? How do we measure it? So we will have to know 
not only the definition, but also how do we measure intelligence? Is it using a kind of IQ test or is it using uh, another type of cognitive test or what? So we will have to have, you know, beside the definition, we will have to know how can we measure that variable. The third characteristic of scientific research is replication. So replication is the reproduction of the results obtained from one study in additional studies. So some people replicate uh, a particular study in another settings or with another sample and with another population. What we want to get from replication process is that we want to get um, the same results or at least similar results in different settings or different populations, different samples. So following the same exact procedures, we want to get similar results in, in many different settings and with many different types of characteristics of populations and samples. That's the ideal results of replication. So what is the role of theory in research? Well, I'd like to say and state and highlight that theory is the most important element or foundations in any research. From theory, we generate predictions or hypotheses or assumptions or expectations of how the result will be. And then from these predictions, we can test it using research process and the Predictions could be confirmed or refuted and either way will be fine. When your prediction is confirmed, then it indicates that this theory is useful in accounting for a phenomenon. So the theory is really useful in explaining the phenomenon that you're trying to explain through the research. But when it's refuted, the theory might be inaccurate. So it may not explain the phenomenon as what the theories or the scholars who generated the or developed the theory uh, at the beginning want it uh, to be. However, that's fine. It means that it might say something too. It might say that it may not be accurate in a specific sample or a specific setting, but it might be accurate in another. So either way, using theory is very important and the most important thing or element in our research. So when the, we, when the prediction is refuted and that indicates that the theory is inaccurate, whether it's in a specific setting or something, then we just retest it or we do another observation yeah, in another settings with another population. Basically, a theory can be developed and redeveloped and revised and revised and revised. And that's, oh, that's okay, because that will make the theory actually uh, stronger. So this is when the role of scientists come into play. The first one is curiosity. So we need to be very curious about many things, especially what... Uh, is related in, in our area of research. That we have to be curious about what, when, how. Whenever you read a research article or journal article, you have to be critical and maybe skeptical about what's uh, happening or the results so that uh, you can gain more insights you know, by being curious. And then as a scientist, we have to be patient because, you know, a theory cannot be developed in just one night. It can be, it can take years, it, you know, like really many years. And it can be, as, as I have mentioned in previous slide, it can be revised and revised and revised. And then we have, it's, the theory can be, you know, like, under definitely like being developed across times and it can change yeah, based on the results that we uh, that we get yeah that we obtain by doing research so as a scientist we have to be patient 
And then the next one is objectivity. Yeah, we have to be very objective in looking at uh, any phenomenon. So we cannot just, uh, you know, take any information just because we like it or because we expect it, it, it in, in a particular way. So when we, if we made a kind of prediction in our research and then it's not confirmed, then we should not be like, oh, you know, like sad or something because that that's the objective results. That's what the objective uh, conclusion is, yeah. So the result shows that perhaps our expectations or what we previously known, uh, what we previously know about something, uh, it may not be confirmed, yeah, or it may be wrong, it may be mistaken, and that's fine, you know, because we have to really be very objective in seeing any phenomenon. And then change, yeah, we have to be very open-minded to change. We have to be very open to change because. As I said, even theory can change across times or across cultures. Yeah. And as a scientist, we, the acceptance of change is the, one of the most important thing that uh, one of the most important characteristics that we have to have. So for a quick refreshment, these are the objectives of psychological research. The first one is description. So we basically want to describe something uh, or a specific phenomenon. So for example, if you want to study about people's behaviors during the pandemic, so you will do a survey, but what they're doing uh, besides working and studying at home, then that's, you're trying to describe a phenomenon. Next is explanation. So after you describe the phenomenon, oh, okay, so that you know that, for example, majority of the people during the pandemic, besides studying and working, they are just doing anything using their gadgets. So gadget related uh, behaviors. Yeah. So either they're just, uh, you know, watching uh, some entertainments or gaming, etc. So you want to explain why are they doing this? You know, maybe they're getting bored or this is the only entertainment that they have or what else? Yeah. After description and explanation comes the prediction. So, okay, then now you can predict that when people have to stay at home for 24 hours a day and seven days a week, and for how many months already right now, then you or you can predict that when people are confined in their home, then majority of the people will just do any gadget related behaviors. And then the last one is control or influence. So, okay, now you already predicted that when people are just staying at home for 24 hours a day and seven days a week and four months, then they will just do anything with their gadget and doing this will probably uh, be harmful for their health, at least both physical health and mental health. Then you can make a kind of proposal that what should we do yeah, to minimize this, to make people still, uh, you know, to make them, to keep them healthy while staying at home, to keep them moving while staying at home. Yeah, something like that. So you can try to influence uh, the behavior or the conclusion that you have uh, obtained during the uh, research, from the research results. So we have talked about scientific research. So now, what is pseudoscience? Pseudoscience is an approach that claims to be scientific, but is based on methods and practices that violate many tenets of science. So it's not following those uh, scientific research procedures. It didn't have, it doesn't have any of the aspects or elements of the scientific research. 
there are some examples in psychology. First is the phrenology. You know, phrenology is the, the not the science. You know, the knowledge of um, basically um, concluding or determining someone's personality by uh, checking the bumps yeah, in their heads yeah, from outside, in their skull, basically. And then also brain gym. Yeah? The brain gym is very popular about uh, improving your cognitive abilities or um, even intelligence. And, and it's very popular with, uh, in, you know, with in, in preschool yeah? and kindergarten that lots of teachers are doing brain gyms to the kids in the hope of uh, stimulating the children's cognitive abilities. Uh, well, this is a very, um, you know, a very interesting thing. It's very popular, but this uh, strategy is actually not based on research that are following that was following uh, scientific research criteria. So we will, as psychologists or someone who is studying psychology or psychology researchers, we need to be very mindful about trusting something uh, that we're not sure yeah what was the foundation uh, that founded that founded this kind of uh, strategy or our method yeah on something so these are the differences yeah between the characteristics of the scientific and non-scientific or everyday approaches to knowledge. Uh, we can see from the general approach, you know, normally the non-scientific or the everyday knowledge use intuitive approach, while scientific approach use empirical method. And attitude, in terms of at attitude, uh, the non-scientific knowledge is uncritical, so just accepting it, while the scientific approach is more critical and skeptical. So we have to be always skeptical or critical about anything, even when it's already tested in a certain research, we can try to replicate and see how it goes. And then uh, in terms of observations, uh, non-scientific or everyday knowledge is obtained with uh, using casual or uncontrolled observation, while scientific approach uses systematic and controlled uh, observation. In, in terms of reporting, the non-scientific or everyday knowledge is typically biased and very subjective, while the scientific knowledge is unbiased and objective. In terms of concept, non-scientific or everyday knowledge uses ambiguous uh, with surplus meaning, so ex exaggerate everything. Uh, and the sci in scientific uh, approach, uh, we use clear definitions like the oper operational definitions yeah, and operational specificity. So very specific and precise about something that we want to measure. The instruments for non-scientific or everyday knowledge is imprecise and probably inaccurate. Scientific method is accurate and precise because it must have followed a certain procedure a measurement is not valid or reliable for the non-scientific knowledge, but it has to be valid and reliable for the scientific knowledge. And for the hypothesis, the non-scientific or everyday knowledge is normally untestable, while for scientific knowledge, it has to be testable. So these are the references. Okay, see you again next time.